My next quote, and this is the last quote in my bit, uh, is also about NATO, and it's uh, from Professor Robert Service, who wrote in The Observer this weekend, and he also says that the murmurings about the onset of a new Cold War will help nobody, and that NATO's eastward expansion is provoking Russian paranoia. But in your book, you write that the eastward expansion of NATO and uh, Euro-Atlanticism has not been easy. Uh, but yet has been very positive. And you quote Poland as an example, you quote the Baltic states. So should Russian uh, protestations be just dismissed? Well, I think one has to <coughs> distinguish between what one might call manufactured hysterics and real Russian fears. Now, if one was looking at the map, one would say there are two things that, and looking at the statistics, there are two things that Russia ought to be really scared of. And one's China and the other's Muslims. And those are big threats. Russia. You have the most resource-rich part of Russia is the most thinly populated, and it's next to a very thickly populated part of, um, part of China. And the Muslim birth rate in Russia is very high, and the Slav Russian birth rate is low, and Russia has very troubled relations both with the North Caucasus and potentially um, with, 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 with Central Asia. And so it seems to be those, those are real fears. I think it's perfectly reasonable to talk to Russia more seriously about nukes. And in fact, I do argue very strongly in the book that the American administration has been wrong to um, assume that dominance equals stability. It would actually be, it was crazy, I think, to go to rip up the ABM treaty and not press ahead with START through. And both sides would be better off with deep cuts in their strategic nuclear arsenals. And it's quite reasonable, I think, for Russia to try and attract some attention on that. And I think it's also very reasonable that as, if Russia is the second biggest space power uh, after the United States to try and have some kind of international legal, legal order in space. So on those things, I think Russia has a case. I don't think the case on NATO expansion stacks up. It, NATO is, um, the expansion of NATO to Poland, first of all to Central Europe and then to the Baltics and the Balkans, has always been accompanied by this kind of breast-beating hysterics in Russia about this is going to be an absolute disaster. But the effect has actually been very positive. This has calmed down these countries. Do you really think, if you remember what the Baltic states were like in the mid-1990s, with these excitable amateurish militias, with mutinies happening, with all sorts of dangers of provocation, and now you have small, well-disciplined militaries that are part of, um, you know, heavily integrated into, in, into NATO. And it seems to me that must be good for Russia to have stable, democratic, well-governed neighbors. And the spread of the EU and NATO eastwards has created a zone of stability and security and prosperity, which one would think Russia would be pleased about. And it seems to me rather troubling that Russia find, gets on very well with countries when they're dictatorships, so it has excellent relations with Uzbekistan and Belarus, and yet finds it so difficult to get on with the democracies on its borders. It's totally uh, my question is about President Putin. You mentioned uh, judo as one of his uh, talents. Uh, but in your book, you have a very interesting chart uh, which uh, shows his popularity, his uh, rise <coughs> from zero to hero, if I remember correctly. Yeah. How did he do it? Well, I think I mean, one point I make very strongly in the book is I'm not saying that the 1990s were a wonderful time for Russia. And then the ex-KGB came along and ruined it. And I think we, we, we simply can't understand what's happening now in Russia unless we take off our perhaps rather rose-tinted spectacles when we look at the 1990s. That it, it, I think that the, the way the Kremlin portrays the 1990s is a bit unfair, but for most Russians, um, this was a time of huge economic dislocation, um, it, collapse of industry, theft of national assets by oligarchs, the um, feeling the country was disintegrating, perhaps most of all the feeling of embarrassment that the head of state was this embarrassing drunk who couldn't get off the plane to meet the Irish Prime Minister and seize the baton and try to conduct a military ban during a visit to Germany. And I think any country would find um, that was a rather, um, was rather a repellent period. And I think what Putin has done very successfully is to portray his rule and the rule of the ex-KGB people around him as um, not only the con a contrast but also an antidote to those uh, to those 90, 90, 1990s. Now, the way it happened, I think, is quite troubling. And as I point out in the book, the apartment bombings of 1999, I think, are one of the big, loose threads that, if they were tugged hard, a lot of this sort of image of, of Putin as the, as the great leader would come undone. The other big thread which should be pulled hard is the corruption 
and the question of beneficial ownership. Who owns Gunvor? Who owns Skylink? Who owns Megafon? Who owns Sovgut Nefty Gas? I could, you know, the list continues. But, um, but corruption and the apartment block bombings in 1999, I think, are a big loose threat. Now, what the apartment bo block bombings did was to take um, Russian public opinion and kind of crystallize it behind the feeling that the country was under attack by these apparently very well organized um, terrorists who were killing hundreds of Russians in their sleep. And th therefore, the answer was a very strong leader. Now, I think that was very cynical. And I look in some detail in the book at the, um, the particularly the Ryazan bombing where I just don't think that the official explanation makes sense. Why would two FSB officers steal a car, drive to Riazan, and then buy sacks of sugar in the market, put real detonators and timers on them, and then put them in an unguarded basement in order to test security? That, that is the official version. I'm not making this up. That is a defense exercise. Well, but, you know, whose vigilance are you trying to test? And, I mean, added to all the other circumstantial evidence, so I'm afraid, that, I mean, I, I can't prove this, but I think the balance of evidence is that the authorities had a hand in the 1999 bombings and that Mr. Putin was a beneficiary. I wouldn't necessarily go as far as saying he knew what was happening then um, and that he was, he was directly involved in ordering it. Um, but I do, I, I, do, I do find it very troubling, and I think that this manipulation of public opinion is one of the things that has you know, helped him retain popularity all the way through. Most Russians get their information from television, and the television gives, is, is under Kremlin control and gives Putin an extremely easy ride. You know, these carefully staged photo opportunities of the, in the sort of action man, superman sort of poses of fishing, piloting planes, stripped to the waist on the judo mat, all this sort of thing. And an extraordinary reluctance to ask tough questions. And I think I mean, it's one of the really striking things is the record of Putin over the last eight years um, and, the, and, the, and the government has actually been rather incompetent. Mm -hmm. You know, they've had this bonanza of tens of billions of dollars coming in from the high oil and gas prices, which has sent living standards shooting up, and that's great, and obviously a great contrast to the 1990s. But where are the new roads? The, um, even Mr. Medvedev's own think tank admits that the, the amount of paved roads in Russia has gone down since 2000. You know, that's really striking. They say there are two big problems in Russia, fools and roads. Well, I can't, you know, we can't judge the fools, but on the roads, you know, where are the new roads? Uh, one more question about winners and losers. One of the chapters in your book uh, is entitled Winners and Losers of This Regime. Uh, the winners are sort of obvious. We know who they are, and you mentioned yourself, the living standards, the uh, average earnings are up, and the rest of it. Who are the losers in this setup? Well, I think you have to look inside and outside Russia when you talk about the losers. And I think, I mean, inside Russia, the losers are, are really everybody who might have benefited from a real modernization of infrastructure and public services. But um, you know, we've seen enormous debts <coughs> being built up by Russian companies, um, corruption entrenched up to a level that would have been unimaginable even in the Yeltsin era. And I suspect that you know, people will look back on this period and say, where did all the money go? You know, we had these 10 years of, 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 of not just high but rising oil prices. And actually, you know, we blew it. And so I think, the, you know, in one sense, the losers are, 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 you know, are, all, are all Russians. Um, I think the um, the ethnic minorities inside Russia are having a very tough time at the moment, and the sort of institutionalization of state racism is really worrying. I was absolutely horrified to see um, uh, reports of a meeting of the Moscow police chief with representatives of all the ethnic minority um, communities in, Russia, in, in Moscow who'd gone to see, to, to see him to talk about the, um, the wave of racist attacks. I think there was, a, at one point, there was a racist murder happening every day in Moscow. And his response was, well, why don't you make sure that your ethnic minority communities um, commit fewer crimes, and then, and then there wouldn't be any reason to attack you? And that was, I mean, to, that was absolutely sort of astonishingly sort of a bad response. But I think the, the losers right now are the countries outside Russia, because we are losing, and we're seeing the finalization of Western Europe, and the reestablishment of a kind of political and economic dominance um, of Russia and Eastern Europe, and that's really worrying. Um, and if you look at what's happened in the, just in the, the months of this year with the South Stream pipeline, where we've seen Serbia, which you know, admittedly has no reason to love the West right now, but also Bulgaria and Hungary, 
just falling into the Russian camp on, on, South, on South Stream, you know, you know, that, that is a loss to all of Europe. We are losing our energy security as we speak.